this is what you might hear if you answered that call. This is, this is what you might hear if you listened to that new voicemail message. Let me see if I can get this right. This call is to inform you that IRS is filing lawsuit against you. To get more information about this case, please call immediately on our department number. Then a phone number is provided. I repeat, phone number provided again. I repeat, phone number may be provided a third time. This matter is a very serious emergency, and we are calling from investigation team of IRS. Thank you. Now, if you don't recognize that, God bless you. Count yourself blessed, right? Count yourself a blessed individual <laughs> this morning. Most of you, of course, will recognize that transcript or something like it from those seemingly inescapable robocalls that we get on our phones. Now, most people today, I believe, are aware of scams like this. They've been going on for a number of years, sadly. But think with me for just a moment. Think with me about why this kind of scam has worked in the first place. Why has it worked in the past? Sadly, why does it continue to work with some today? I think you would agree that the effectiveness of this particular scam is directly linked to the supposed identity of the entity leaving you a message. That's why it works, right? That's why it works. If it's really the IRS communicating with you, the Internal Revenue Service communicating with you, then it's probably in your best interest to respond to the call, to call them back. If it, that's really them. So it's like if the robocall you picked up and it simply said, hey, this is Lou from Tri-City Tax Consultants, you're not calling this guy back, right? You're not gonna, you're not gonna return his call. He sounds sketchy on the phone. You would, be rightly, you would rightly be less concerned about the consequences of respond, not responding to that message than if, in fact, the IRS was actually reaching out to you. 2,000 years ago, the Apostle Paul touched on this same topic in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. No, he wasn't writing to the Thessalonian Christians about robocalls. They didn't thankfully have them back then. He was writing about the identity of the entity leaving them a message. That's what Paul was doing. Turn there if you have not already to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. We are, we are establishing our base camp in verse 13 of chapter 2. 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 13. Thessalonica, cool name for a city. Thessalonica was a city in northern Greece. It's an area historically known as Macedonia. It was a separate kingdom even before, uh, up before the Romans came in there and conquered it. Uh, Macedonia, you think of uh, uh, Philip of Macedon, whose son was so famous. His name was Alexander the Great. This is where they came from, this area here. That's where Thessalonica was. If you want to read about how Jesus came to this city, the message of Jesus came to this city, how the church here was established, you can do that in Acts chapter 17. You'll read about Paul and Silas and their ministry in this city and the establishing of this particular church in Thessalonica. So this letter to the Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians, there's two of them in our, in our, in our scriptures, 1 and 2 Thessalonians, this was probably written not long after Paul and his team were, for their own safety, sent away by the new Christians in this city. And it may be, in fact, that, that, that Paul and Silas and the, the team that accompanied them, and maybe one or two or three other people that were part of that group, it may be that they were only in Thessalonica ministering for eight to ten weeks. Now, can you imagine uh, 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 preaching about Jesus, sharing the good news about Jesus, and then establishing a church, and then having to leave just in a couple months? That, that would really weigh on your heart, wouldn't it? 
And we're going to hear that coming up. But know that that's the context here in terms of Paul writing to this young group of believers. But look with me at verse 13 of chapter 2. Take a look in your, in your Bibles. I will have some text on the, script, on the screen up here, but I don't like to put all the text because I like to have you in your Bibles. This is training ground, right? This is practice time. If we learn to use our word here, we're in the scriptures, flipping, looking at some things. That's a good thing that will hopefully carry over into your week that your Bible's not just collecting dust. You've got it. You're listening to it. You're, you're reading it. So take a look in your Bible or on your Bible app. 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 13. This is what Paul writes. Paul says, We also thank God constantly for this. That when you receive the word of God, this is him going, hey, remember the story of how we met you, how we brought the word to you. When you you receive the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. So the identity of the entity that was leaving or sending the Thessalonians a message was God Himself. It was God Himself communicating with them. He was doing this through Paul and Silas, no doubt, right? He was communicating through them, but their words were ultimately God's words. They were sharing words that came from God Himself with these individuals, That's why Paul is so grateful here. The converts in Thessalonica, they recognized who was ultimately speaking to them. So what was this Word of God communicated through but far bigger than the Word of men? What was this Word? Well, look back at 2.9. Chapter 2, verse 9. Just move up. To verse 9, Paul says there in maybe the second half of the verse, we worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you while we proclaim to you the what? The gospel of God. Remember, gospel is just a word. He wasn't saying, yeah, we were bringing gospel music to you. You No, gospel just means good news. We were bringing the good news of God to you. That's what gospel means. To them, look back at chapter 2, verse 2. Jump up to verse 2. Paul testifies, we had boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel of God. There it is again. The gospel of God. Chapter 1, verse 5, if you want to look at that, that also affirms the same idea. This good news, the good news these men and women had received, they received as good news from God. The message about Jesus. They received that it was accepted. Paul says it was accepted not as a wonderful expression of human storytelling. It was not accepted by the Thessalonians as human wisdom. Like, this is a wonderful book, inspired like Shakespeare is inspired. I really love it. Some of my favorite authors are here in the Bible. No, 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 no. This was accepted by these individuals as the declaration of God Himself. God revealing Himself to them. But here's the question I want us to spend some time on this morning. If we know the setup, right? We know how what's been happening here in Thessalonica as Paul writes them, reminding them of when they first met, when he preached this message to them, declared it to them. If we know that, that's set up for us, we want to ask this question this morning. Take a look here on the screen. If the Thessalonians recognized his message as God's message, how did Paul recognize that they recognized the message in this way? (laughs) Message in that way. That's a really relevant question for us, isn't it? Because we want to ask ourselves, do I recognize that fact? Have I accepted this word as the word of God? You might tell yourself one thing in your head, but there might be a different answer, in fact, when you examine your life. 
Take a look with me at what, how Paul answers this, how we answer this question based on what we have here. We don't have to speculate. Paul provides us with not one, but two answers to that question. Maybe more, but I'm going to highlight two this morning. So if we move to the very next verse, verse 14, we discover that number one, their acceptance was evident from their endurance. Their acceptance of this word as the word of God was evident from their endurance. Paul seems to say, verse 14, how do we know that you accepted our message as God's message? For you, brothers, became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea. For you suffered the same things from your own countrymen as they did from the Jews. Now, Paul made this same point. He highlighted this same feature about the experience of these believers back in chapter 1. Flip back there, scan back over to the next page. Verse one, chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. He says, And you became imitators of us and of the Lord, the Lord Jesus, for you received the Word. There it is. We're talking about receiving the Word. How did they receive the word? You received it, Paul says, in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit. Who receives anything suffering, trouble, trial, tribulation, hardship, difficulty? Who receives that with joy? Where does that joy come from? The joy of the Holy Spirit. It's a supernatural joy in the face face of agonizing hardship. That's what happened here. Chapter 1, verse 7, so that you became an example to all of the believers in Macedonia, northern Greece, and Achaia, southern Greece, all over Greece. Paul accepted this fact, this reality of their experience, their example. Paul accepted this as powerful evidence of their beliefs about the gospel because Jesus himself had taught this same principle. He taught that such suffering, that much affliction would ultimately serve to expose false faith. Tribulation and trial exposes false faith. Take a look at what Jesus said. Matthew chapter 13, verses 20 and 21. As for what was sown, the seed of the Word sown on rocky ground, this is the one, this is the parable of the soils, called the parable of the sower. It's really the parable of the soils is the better name for it. That's what he describes. This seed of the Word was sown in people's hearts. And the one that's described as rocky ground, this is the person who hears the Word and immediately receives it with joy. Did you know that someone can hear about Jesus and become very, very emotional about receiving that Word and yet they are not truly right with God? They are not truly changed. Emotion, an emotional response to the good news about Jesus is no certain assurance or no certain sign that someone really has been affected deep down. We need to understand that. Too much of our Christian ministry is built on hype. It is built on experience. It is built on the moment. We have to guard ourselves against that. Can there be great joy and emotion and powerful emotion that comes with true conversion? True salvation, true deliverance, true change? Absolutely. Absolutely. Right? If you came to hear the best news of your life, to be a forgiven sinner, welcomed in as a child of God, how could you not be joyful? How could you not experience peace? What are you, a robot? No, no. Right? No. We know that that happens, but it's no certain sign. It's no certain proof that that's happened. So what Jesus says here is that person receives it with joy, yet he has, she has no root in himself, herself, but endures for a while, walking, talking as a Christian. But guess what happens? But when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the Word, immediately he or she falls away. Once that pressure is applied, once push comes to shove, you begin to get a true sense of what has taken place in a person, what they really believe, 
who's really first in their life, what they value, what they live for. It comes to the surface. It's exposed. It's squeezed out of them like someone squeezing a sponge. You see what's coming out, don't you? You get, you get that visual. I think we all know that there are certain people in certain circumstances who will appear to accept this good news, this gospel as the word of God. It appears that way, especially when it's easy to do so. What do I mean by easy to do so? I mean that that confession, that belief, costs them nothing in real life. They make a confession around people who are urging them to do so. They make a confession around people who are celebrating them when it's made. And that's not wrong. We're just describing the situation They are told that their faith maybe is a private matter and not a new lens by which they see the world, not a catalyst for change in their very public life. Maybe they buy into that idea. They confess Jesus as Lord, but maybe there is no expectation really that they should actually follow him as Lord in every area of their life, especially in those areas that would require genuine sacrifice on their part, especially in those areas that would require radical non-conformity to the world's way of doing things. That's easy. It doesn't cost them anything. And some Christians motivated by a sincere desire to help people have actually compromised the message. They've said, oh, Jesus told you to take up your cross. Well, no, 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 no. Let me take that cross from you. You don't need to take up a cross. Take up maybe this pebble instead, or I don't know. Don't do that, because that's kind of (laughs) off-putting. Well, that's why Jesus gave it to us, right? It is off-putting. It it kills something in us that needs to die so that He might give us new life. As in so many places, in so many generations, what we see here though is that the faith of the Thessalonians was tested by temptations to give up to give in to the world that ultimately hates God's truth. They were tested right from the get-go, and Paul understood that they were tested in this way. Weeks of them believing, right? Weeks of them being established or not being established in their new, newly found faith. Paul understood this. He knew that his time with these believers had been short. This is why he was worried. Take a look here on the screen, or you can look in your Bible at at, at chapter 3, verses 3 through 5, where Paul says this, For you yourselves know that we are destined for this, for suffering. It was one of the things he told them when he was with them for that, that couple months. We know this from Acts chapter 14, for example, where we get a little summary of how these guys ministered in the churches in those early days. One of the things they told new new Christians right away was, this is not a cakewalk. This is not the primrose path, right? This is not that false prosperity gospel that we hear today. Oh, come to Jesus. He's going to make your life perfectly better, right? You're going to be healthy. You're going to be wealthy. You're going to have a trophy wife. You're going to go all these things that you can have because God wants to bless you in this way. No, no. They were telling these people the exact opposite. You follow Jesus, you're going to be persecuted. It may not be overt persecution like you get thrown in jail or you get executed, but it may be that you look, people are looking at you like you have a third head, a, you know, a second head, a third eye. They're just, they're thinking, you are weird, dude. We know from the early writings of non-Christians, Roman writers who would say the Christians are weird. They get together and they say they love each other, but they call each other brother and sister but they say they have this like love and this relationship with one another. Even the husbands and wives are calling each other brother and sister. They're marrying their brothers and sisters? What? And they say when they come together, they're drinking somebody's blood and eating somebody's body. What? (laughs) It was very weird to the Romans. These Christians were very weird to the Romans, and they were called atheists. Did you know that? Christians were called atheists. Why were they called atheists? Because they did not believe in the Roman and Greek gods. That's why they were called atheists. So they stood out. They were going to be persecuted. Paul says that. I told you this. You know that we're destined for this. For when we were with you, 
This is chapter 3, verse 4. We kept telling you beforehand that we were to suffer affliction just as it has come to pass and just as you know. You know it from personal experience, brothers and sisters. You've gone through it. Chapter 3, verse 5. For this reason, when I could bear it no longer, says Paul, I sent someone to learn about your faith for fear that somehow the tempter had tempted you and our labor would be in vain. Wow, I love Paul's honesty. He's being honest and saying, man, we got pulled from you so quickly and you're so young in your faith, we were really concerned, really deeply concerned about what had happened to you, all the persecution that you're beginning to suffer from your countrymen. He was concerned that it might, that it might be proven that they had not really received this word as the word of God. But in fact, as we heard in our main verse in 2.13, the Thessalonians had accepted God's word about the suffering of Christ and God's word to them about the suffering of those who follow Christ. They had heard what Paul had said to them, this gospel message about a suffering Savior dying on a cross, crucified by the Romans. They had heard that message, and they had heard the message that those who follow Him will also be mistreated, will also be rejected by the world. And they had believed that because their faith was the evidence of that. Their faith in the face of such hostility. It was evident from their endurance in the face of such affliction. But Paul tells us something else. So their acceptance was evident from their endurance. But take a look here. Number two, their acceptance was also evident from their worship. This is what Paul tells his readers about reports he's gotten from other churches in their region. Look at chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. Chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. For they themselves, these other churches, they report concerning us. They're telling us about our own story with you. Concerning us, the kind of reception we had among you. How were they received? How was the word received? Look at this. These churches are saying, oh, we know about this story of how they received you. They know how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for His Son from heaven whom He raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. What these individuals believed about the Word that was delivered to them was clear from the seismic shift that had taken place in their worship. It's one thing to endure persecution. It's quite another thing to give up your gods. They gave up their gods. They gave up their gods. The God, gods on whom they had grounded, the gods you, that you've grounded your entire spiritual and earthly well-being upon, the, the gods you sought for rain, and romance, and prosperity, and the welfare of your community, you're walking away from them, you're giving them up. That's exactly what the Thessalonian believers had done. They had done that. And that radical and that revolutionary change was so evident that churches throughout Greece already knew their story by the time Paul had arrived at those churches. <laughs> Paul, how you doing? We're doing great. Can we get a little water? Oh, wait, before we do anything else, we heard about Thessalonica. Paul, we heard about Thessalonica. You did? Yeah, we heard about it, brother. Wow, they did this and this and this and this happened and this happened. Yeah, I know, we were there. Yeah, and then, and then this took place and you said this and they believed this. Yeah, I know, I lived it. <laughs> But Paul was so amazed that they knew of that, this story because their, their testimony, their example, had just, just reverberated throughout the whole country. Powerful. Of course, the acceptance evident from their endurance, we know that was vitally connected to the acceptance evident from their worship. We can't separate points one and two up there on the screen, can we? They go together. 
How do they go together? Here's an example. In many cases, when you give up your gods, it's the very thing that incites animosity from those who still serve those gods. You walk away from something you lived for and gave yourself to, spent your money on, something that obsessed your thoughts. That's right. Those are the idols today. Don't consider yourself off the hook. You're like, well, I don't have any like, weird statues in my, right? In my office, I have a little tiki from Hawaii. That's about as close as I get to an idol, you know, a little souvenir that I brought back. <laughs> Maybe you have something like that. But you and I, we don't have little false deities but we have false gods in our hearts that we're tempted to, first and foremost, putting ourselves up as gods, playing God over our own lives. I'm the master and commander of my destiny. I'll do whatever I want to do. That's playing God. God's the master and commander of all of our destinies. The question, we don't change that. The question is, will we line up with that truth? Will we actually live in reality? Or will we continue to try to uh, you know, try to play gods and basically beating our head against a wall, not getting anywhere, hurting ourselves and hurting others. When you give up your gods, the people around you often are, that's where that animosity or persecution from. Boy, such and such used to be like this. Man, now he's a total downer, total like, you know, why aren't you coming out with us? Why aren't you doing the same things that we're doing anymore? Oh, you're holy now. Oh, you're like Joe Righteous all of a sudden. Like you found religion. You did whatever. Like, oh, sorry. Oh, did I, did I say a swear word? Oh, I'm so sorry for your virgin ears. Oh, I didn't mean to, you know, that kind of persecution. That kind of, some might call it like, oh, we're just playing with you. We're just ribbing you. But you can feel that, hey, why aren't you with us anymore? Why aren't you willing to cut corners like we're doing? Why aren't you willing to make these uh, ethically questionable choices in the office anymore. We were all benefiting from this when we did it. Persecution, hostility. We also know that one, points one and two are connected because more importantly, it was the focus of their worship in Thessalonica, true worship, that fueled their faithful endurance. It's because they had given up their gods that they endured in the face of such conflict, animosity, persecution. That's why. Look again at verses one, sorry, chapter one, verses nine and ten. When you have trusted in news of a living and true God, not just a stone or marble, marble statue in a temple somewhere, when you have trusted in a Savior who has beaten death. When you have trusted in a king, accepted a message of a king who will come for you one day, a redeemer who was delivered over to wrath for your sake that he might deliver you from ultimate wrath, when you have worshipfully given your heart to that kind of God, you are able to stand firm in the face of any affliction. That's how you stand firm. With joy. Right? It wasn't like grin and bear it. Like, yeah, now I'm a Christian. Now I know that, uh, now I know that if I endure persecution, I have to grin and bear it. People are laughing, pointing. You lose your job, something. You're just like, uh, uh, praise the Lord. Uh, uh, I don't like this. Uh. That's not these believers. What were they doing? We rejoice that we have been counted worthy to suffer in the name of Jesus. We know that we were to expect this. This is what we're destined for. And it's evidence of the fact that there's a friction between us and the world. It's evidence that we're not of the world anymore even though we're in the world still. There's friction there now. I, I rejoice in that, God, that you're working. And I'm finding that as I'm doing this, you're giving me spiritual resources, power to actually have perspective to keep going through this. And I know that even if they take my life, my Lord is a Lord of resurrection because he rose from the dead. He beat death. What's the worst they could do to you? Kill you? Ha <laughs> ha! It doesn't matter to us. 
We will die anyway. All of you will die at some point. That's inevitable. But if we have hope in the face of death, they can't take anything from us. They might take our life, but they cannot take our Jesus from us. They cannot take eternal life from us. They cannot take the promises of God from us. Amen? This is the God for whom we wait, who's coming back. And that hope of a future without any tears, without any disease, that hope of that future is what carries you through the hard times. Are you facing hard times right now? Are you going through it right now? Listen to the Word and receive it not as my message or the message of these human writers of Scripture, but as the Word of God. Listen again to the text. 2.13 And we also thank God constantly for this, brothers and sisters, that when you receive the Word of God which you heard from us, you accepted it. Not as the Word of men. That's abundantly clear. But as what it really is, the Word of God which is at work in you believers. God's work was undoubtedly, God's Word was undoubtedly at work in these believers, wasn't it? We've just looked at two aspects of their new life and we've seen it so clearly. And Paul is incredibly thankful for that fact. He's just gushing in this book. But what about you? What about you in light of chapter 2, verse 13? What about you? Have you and do you receive the message of the Gospel, the good news about Jesus, If we broaden that, do you receive the testimony of all Scripture, Old Testament, New Testament, the books that we recognize that God has given us? Do you recognize that testimony as a message from God Himself? Think for a minute about the very subtle and alternative ways that we can accept the Bible and the Bible's central message, which is the Gospel. These are the alternative ways that individuals, people can hear it and accept it. Everyone we're talking about here in a minute here, these examples, they accept the Bible. They're not hostile to the Bible. They accept it. And our churches are full of these people. These are alternative, very subtle ways to accept it but not accepting it as the Word of God. We can accept it simply as the supreme moral compass. It becomes an authoritative repository for our family values, our traditional values. Oh, this is how I was raised. (laughs) Can you believe the culture? Oh, wow. I do this because the Bible says I I should do it. It's authoritative. It's got the moral principles we need. The things that we were raised with or maybe we've adopted those for ourselves later in life and for our families. Supreme moral compass, number one. Number two, we can also accept the gospel simply as a kind of secret handshake and the Bible simply as a kind of community manual. Or to put this another way, we accept the gospel as the key to acceptance in a particular community. And the Bible is our guidebook for navigating that community. What's the false idol there? It's community. It's belonging. Those are good things. But we don't make good things into ultimate things, do we? And when you are driven by a community of people that you so badly want to belong to, you will compromise often what you say you believe to get in the door to stay in the good graces of others. That's number two. Number three, some might accept this message simply as theological or maybe philosophical ammunition to fight our political and our ideological opponents in some culture war. As things become more and more heated in our country and divided, you will see more and more people go to the Bible on both sides of the aisle, making Jesus their poster boy to say, this is what God says is right. 
And no, we're not going to waste time with trying to argue the merits of our case. We're just going to throw stones at each other and say, I'm on God's side and walk in our own pride and haughtiness. What does the Bible become? It's become the servant of the ideological or political agenda. Number four, some accept the Bible simply as a token of family identity and connection. Maybe you learn it. Maybe you use it because that's what good people in your family do and have always done. To neglect the Gospel or the Bible for you, if you were honest deep down, would trouble you because it would mean neglecting your family heritage. Number five, still others accept it simply as a self-help manual. It's stories, it's poetry, it's wisdom, it's role models have proven extremely helpful to people in navigating hard relationships, calming your nerves, managing your temper, temper, or in some other way, it's proven helpful, helpful guidance for your own journey of personal healing and personal fulfillment. Number six, the more religious version of number five is accepting the Bible not simply as a self-help manual, but as a self-salvation manual. Like so many of Jesus' religious opponents in the Scriptures, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, the lawyers, like so many of them, Scripture can be accepted and revered as some kind of ladder that helps us work our way up to God through a mastery of the knowledge in the Bible and obedience to the rules that it contains. And number seven, finally, we can accept the Gospel and the Bible as a whole simply because it serves our agenda of self-promotion. We see in its context, sorry, we see in its content a kind of social capital. Uh, Knowing the Word becomes an important skill in our quest for personal success in religious circles, whatever that quest looks like. The Bible is our capital, social capital, capital for success, catalyst for success in some some venture that we have in our lives. Brothers and sisters, Friends, it's important that I stress again to you just how subtle these perspectives can be. You can hear them and think, yes, good word, Pastor. Good word. Amen. But if you actually stopped and dug down deep into your heart, you would realize that one of those just described you. Right? One of those just describe you. If you're honest with yourself, one of those would describe you. There are often deeply in there are often deeply embedded in the hearts of many a solid churchgoer, a morally upright community member, a regular giver, a zealous defender of the faith. These are there in their heart, and yet these people do not actually belong to Jesus because they did not accept the gospel as God's word. They accepted it, but they didn't accept it as God's Word. It served some other purpose. It became something different for them. It scratched an itch, but it wasn't the itch for forgiveness of sins and new life and worship and genuine conversion. That's not what it was. As we read in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, take a look. We know that we need to accept this gospel, this word of God, as his word, because without faith, it's impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. And we only know that because of what he's revealed through his word. But please remember this. Please remember this. All of these subtle and alternative appraisals or assessments of the Word can tempt even the healthiest Christian. These seven things I just mentioned to you, they can tempt you as well. Paul's words here should be a challenge to us and it should equip us 
because all of us can slip into these same mindsets, mindsets from time to time. Again, the trap may not be obvious to you, but its influence will be evident from how you approach the Word and what you live like after your time in the Word. How can you know if you've received and are receiving this Word as God's own Word? Well, just remember the example of the Thessalonian believers. You will find yourself pressing forward in the face of affliction. Right? If you've accepted the Word as God's Word and you find yourself pressing forward like they have in the face of real difficult times in your life, relying on God, there's a good chance that you've really received the Word as His Word. And you will find yourself pressing forward in that call to give up your gods. You cannot serve two masters, Jesus said. You can't do it. You can't serve God in money. We know, that we, we know we can't serve two masters, but we try. It doesn't keep us from trying oftentimes as Christians. We let something dominate and rule our lives. Some dreams, some vision, and these aren't bad things. Sometimes they can be very bad things, very destructive things, very unhealthy things, but sometimes they're very good things, things that we need, things that we want, but we've blown them out of proportion. We've exaggerated their influence. We look for them and ask them to give us things they can never give us. But when we receive the word as God's word, guess what? We're able to say, I'm going to give that up. I'm going to set that to the side. Doesn't mean it's not hard. Doesn't mean it's not a struggle. But in the end, you give those up. You put those to the side. And you say, no, no gods before you. You are my God. You are the living and true God. I want to live for you and serve you above everything else. If that's the kind of life that you want to experience more and more, that affliction enduring, that worship reforming kind of power we're talking about here, let me suggest two application points, okay? Real quickly. First, pray about your assessment of the Word. Take time personally to say, I've heard what was said this morning. I need to think about that carefully for my own, my own life. Even if it turns your life upside down, ask God to help you to see the truth about your relationship to the Bible. Do you treat it like a religious textbook or like His book? What matters most to you? That it's inspiring to you or that it's inspired? Are you ultimately looking for some practical advice from the Bible or are you listening for His powerful, precious voice? Or maybe God's Word just sits collecting dust in your room while lesser entities have your full attention every day. Amazingly, the very message, that very phrase, gospel or good news that we've talked about and it's been thrown around here the whole time this morning as I've shared the word with you. Amazingly, that message itself tells us that Jesus Christ died for word-neglecting people like us. Word-distorting people like us. Word-minimizing people like us. He died for us. His grace is abundant even for those who turn to the voice of idols. Do you believe that? His grace is abundant. So I say to you, confess these things to Him. Confess these things to Him. Seek the change that God loves to give. He loves to give that kind of change. Ask Him for it this morning, but be honest about your relationship with His Word. Second, every time you pick up the Word or you receive Scripture from a friend or you hear it in a sermon or you read it in a book or you read it on a blog, you simply ask yourself every time that you hear it or read it, what would I do if I heard this same Word declared to me right now by a voice from heaven? or from a burning bush, or in a dream that I knew was more than a dream, or from Jesus Christ Himself standing before me. Would I think about that word differently? Would I respond to that word differently? 
Brothers and sisters, <laughs> friends, we aren't talking about whether or not the IRS is really calling you and leaving you voice messages. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about whether or not your maker, your creator, the uncaused cause that gave rise to every single thing in all creation, we're talking about whether or not God, the Almighty, all-powerful, all-knowing, everywhere present, we're talking about whether or not God, the judge of all the earth, Genesis 18, God, the ancient of days, Daniel 7, God, the great I am, Exodus chapter 3, we're talking about whether or not that God, the true and living God, is really calling you, speaking to you. Communicating with you. Guiding you. Correcting you. Enlightening you. Loving you through His Word. If He is, if it really is Him, then it changes everything. It changes everything. In the same letter, think about just one more way that, that Paul drives home this same idea. This is 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. For God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. He just talked about this. Uh, this is God's will for you, your sanctification, that each person know how to control his, own, his or her own vessel that you abstain from sexual immorality. We're in a sex-crazed, sex-obsessed culture, my friends. <laughs> Everywhere. Talk about an idol today. People give their time, money, attention to it. This, this idea of sensuality and pleasure and sexuality, it's, it's always been off the rails, but it seems like, whoo, it's like way off the rails, really going crazy out there. But God's call to those who know Him is to walk in holiness. That is, to walk a set-apart life. A different path. That's all holiness means. Set apart. Impurity. God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. Therefore, whoever disregards this disregards not man or the word of man or the idea of man or some religious idea that was inherited, some antiquated idea from our Puritan forebears some old-fashioned ideas about sex. That's not... No, no, no. Whoever disregards this is not disregarding man, but God who gives this, His Holy Spirit to you. You see how when we accept it as the Word of God and we don't live it, we disobey it, we reject it and rebel against it, this reminds us that you're not just rejecting some person's view of how this is. You're rejecting your Creator's, your perfect, all-knowing, all-powerful Creator's word to you about how to live, about true life. Have you become so familiar or comfortable with the Bible that you've forgotten who it is speaking to you through its words? Or have you become so distracted by or enamored with the voices of the world that now you're coming to the Bible simply coming to find what you want it to say and not what the living God is actually saying. Is our heart here at Way of Grace to get you into the Scriptures daily? Absolutely. But even more important than that, our heart is to remind you to receive that daily word, to recognize that daily word for what it is. Not the word of men, but the word of God. Amen? Again, thanks be to God that Jesus Christ died for word neglecting, word minimizing people like us. Only through Christ. Can we hear this word for what it truly is? Think about this. The word who was God, John 1.1, 1, 1, took on flesh, John 1.14, that those in the flesh might hear his word as the word of God himself. Ooh, you like that? Wow, what a picture. What a picture God's given us. He died for our spiritual deafness and he lives that we might truly hear. That's the gospel, isn't it? 
He died for our spiritual deafness and He lives. He rose from the dead that we might truly hear every day. So let's give Him thanks, church. Let's give thanks to Him now, asking Him to help us every time that we encounter the Word, whether reading or hearing, that we might depend on Christ in those moments in light of His grace, that we might always stop before we open the Word, stop before we move any further with it when we hear it, and recognize the Word that we are hearing. Recognize it for what